The power of John Donne's words nearly killed a man. It was the late spring of 1623 on the morning of Ascension Day, and Dunn had finally secured for himself celebrity, fortune, and a captive audience. He had been appointed the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral two years before. He was 51, slim, and amply bearded, and his preaching was famous across the whole of London. His congregation, Merchants, aristocrats, actors in elaborate ruffs, the whole sweep of the city came to his sermons carrying paper and ink, wrote down his finest passages, and took them home to dissect and relish, pontificate and argue over. He often wept in the pulpit, in joy and in sorrow, and his audience would weep with him. That morning he was preaching at Lincoln's Inn, Word went out, and people came flocking to hear him speak. That morning, too many people. There was a great concourse of noblemen and gentlemen, and in among the extreme press and thronging, as they pushed closer to hear his words, men in the crowd were shoved to the ground and trampled. Two or three were endangered and taken up dead for the time. There's no record of Dan halting his sermon, so it's likely that he kept going in his rich, authoritative voice as the bruised men were carried off and out of sight. A quarter of a century before that, the same man, then about twenty-three years old, sat for a portrait. He wore a hat big enough to sail a cat in, a big lace collar, an exquisite moustache. Here was the author of some of the most celebratory and most lavishly sexed poetry ever written in English, shared among an intimate and loyal group of hyper-educated friends. Licence my roving hands, and let them go behind, before, above, between, below. O oh, my America, my new-found land, my kingdom, safeliest when with one man manned. Sometime religious outsider and social disaster, sometime celebrity preacher and establishment darling, John Donne was incapable of being just one thing. He reimagined and reinvented himself over and over. He was a poet, lover, essayist, lawyer, pirate, recusant, preacher, satirist, politician, courtier, chaplain to the king, dean of the finest cathedral in London. There are few writers of his time who faced greater horror. Dunn's family history was one of blood and fire. A great-uncle was arrested in an anti-Catholic raid and executed. Another was locked inside the Tower of London, where, as a small schoolboy, Dunn visited him, venturing fearfully in among the men convicted to death. As a student, a young priest whom his brother had tried to shelter was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. His brother was taken by the priest-hunters at the same time, tortured and locked in a plague-ridden jail. At sea, Dunn watched in horror and fascination as dozens of sailors burned to death. He married a young woman, and more, clandestine and hurried by love, and as a result found himself thrown in prison. Once married, they were often poor and at the mercy of richer friends and relations. He knew what it was to be jealous and thwarted and bitter. He was racked by life-threatening illnesses with dozens of bouts of fever. At least three times it was believed he was dying. He lost over the course of his life six children. He lost Anne at the age of thirty-three, her body destroyed by bearing twelve children. He thought often of sin and miserable failure and suicide. He believed us unique in our capacity to ruin ourselves. He wrote, Nothing but man, of all envenomed things, doth work upon itself with inborn sting. He was a man who walked so often in darkness that it became for him a daily commute. But there are also few writers of his time who insisted so doggedly and determinedly on awe. His poetry is wildly delighted and captivated by the body, though broken, though doomed to decay, and by the ways in which thinking fast and hard were a sensual joy akin to sex. He kicked aside the Petrarchan traditions of idealised, sanitised desire. 
he joyfully brought the body to collide with the soul. In his sermons, he reckoned us a disaster, but the most spectacular disaster that has ever been. As he got older, he grew richer, harsher, sterner, and drier, yet he still asserted, It is too little to call man a little world. Except God, man is a diminutive to nothing. Man consists of more pieces, more parts, than the world doth, nay, than the world is. Joy and squalor. Both Dunn's life and work tell that it is fundamentally impossible to have one without taking up the other. Dunn saw, analyzed, lived alongside, even saluted corruption and death. He was often hopeless, often despairing, and yet still he insisted at the very end, it is an astonishment to be alive, and it behoves you to be astonished. You cannot claim a man is an alchemist and fail to lay out the gold. This, then, is an undated poem, probably written for Anne Moore, sometime in his twenties, known as Love's Growth. I scarce believe my love to be so pure as I had thought it was, because it doth endure vicissitude and season as the grass. Methinks I lied all winter when I swore my love was infinite, if spring make it more. But if this medicine, love, which cures all sorrow with more, not only be no quintessence, but mixed of all stuffs, paining soul or sense, and of the sun as working vigour borrow, love's not so pure and abstract as they used to say, which have no mistress but their muse, but, as all else being elemented too, love sometimes would contemplate, sometimes do. Read the opening stanza, and all the oxygen in a five-mile radius rushes to greet you. It's a poem with gleeful tricks and puns in it. But if this medicine love, which cures all sorrow with more, is a small, private gift for Anne Moore, no matter how many millions of other people have read it since, the poem was different for her. Love, he writes, is a mixture of elemental things, as all else being elemented too, and so love sometimes would contemplate, sometimes do. Dunn is more daring than he sounds. The thirteenth-century theologian Thomas Aquinas's ideal was the mixed life, one of contemplation and action. Dunn hijacks the Aquinian ideal for his own erotic purpose. The do is sex. It's the same impulse as in another poem, The Ecstasy, where bodies must join as well as minds, else a great prince in prison lies. True sex, he insists, is soul played out in flesh. Love's growth hangs on the idea of apparently infinite love made more, which once you have read all that he wrote, is wholly unsurprising. John Donne was an infinity merchant. The word is everywhere in his work. More than infinity. Super infinity. In a sermon, he wrote of how he would one day be with God in an infinite, a super infinite, an unimaginable space, millions of millions of unimaginable spaces in heaven. He loved to coin formations with the super prefix. Super edifications, super exaltations, super dying, super universal, super miraculous. It was part of his bid to invent a language that would reach beyond language, because infinite wasn't enough. Both in heaven, but also here and now on earth, Dunn wanted to know something larger than infinity. That version of Dunn, excessive, hungry, longing, is everywhere in the love poetry. Sometimes it was worn lightly. Who has yet written about nudity with more glee, more jokes? In To His Mistress Going to Bed, written in his twenties, the speaker attempts to coax his lover out of her clothes. Full nakedness, all joys are due to thee. 
as souls unbodied, bodies unclothed must be to taste whole joys. The poem could be seen as one of domineering masculinity, except that at the end of it there's a joke. Only the man stands naked. Then there is the wilder, defiantly odd done, typified by the poem for which most people know him, the flea. The speaker watches a flea crawl over the body of the woman he desires. Mark but this flea, and mark in this, how little that which thou deniest me is. Me it sucked first, and now sucks thee, and in this flea our two bloods mingled be. When the poem was first printed in 1633, the typographers used the long S, a letter that looks almost identical to an F, for the words sucked and suck, which offers readers of the third line another more extravagant rendering. Dunn does not, in his love poetry, insist on sweetness. He does not play the my lady is a perfect dove game, beloved by those who came before him. What good is perfection to humans? It's a dead thing. The urgent, the bold, the witty, the sharp, all better than perfection. He took his galvanizing imagination and brought it to bear on everything he wrote, his sermons, his meditations, his religious verse. In the 21st century, Dunn's imagination offers us a form of body armour. His work is protection against the slipshod and the half-baked, against anti-intellectualism, against those who try to sell you their money-ridden vision of sex and love. He is protection against those who would tell you to narrow yourself, to follow fashion in your mode of thought. It's not that he was a rebel. It's that he was a pure original. They do us a service, the true uncompromising originals. They show us what is possible. To tell the story of Dunn's life is to ask a question. How did he, possessed of a strange and labyrinthical mind, navigate the corresponding social and political labyrinths of Renaissance England? What did his imagination look like when he was young, and how was it battered and burnished as he grew older. Did it protect him from sorrow and fury and resentment? To spoil the suspense, it did not. Did it allow him to write out the human problem in a way that we, following on four hundred years later, can still find urgent truth in? It did. Dark texts, he wrote to a friend, need notes and it is possible to see his whole body of work as offering us a note on ourselves. How John Donne saw us with such clarity and how he set down what he knew with such precision and flair that we can seize hold of it and carry it with us. He knew about dread, and it is therefore that we can trust him when he tells us of its opposite, of ravishments and of love. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. In one way, and one way only, it was an auspicious beginning. John Dunn was born on Bread Street in central London, from one end of which you have a clear and easy view of St Paul's Cathedral. He was born in sight of both his future job and his final resting place, which must be rare. In every other way, it was a hard time to come into the world. It was 1572, month unknown, and a Catholic plot to assassinate Queen Elizabeth I had just been foiled. The Duke of Norfolk was executed for treasonous, popish machinating, and it was a bad year in which to be an English Catholic. Dunn's mother, Elizabeth Hayward, was the great-niece of the Catholic martyr Thomas More. She sounds to have been formidable unafraid to assert herself, a woman of whom it was whispered erroneously that she carried the head of Thomas More in her luggage when she travelled. Dunn's father, also John Dunn, was warden of the Ironmongers' Company. 
The family had once owned magnificent estates before they had been confiscated by the crown in the various Tudor shakedowns of Catholic landowners. When Dunn was four, his father died, and his mother married again to John Simmings, a physician. It might sound a gentle, upper-middle kind of upbringing, but to be born a Catholic was to live with a constant, low-level background thrum of terror. It was in the spring of 1574, when Dunn was a toddler, that disaster first came for the family. His mother's uncle, Thomas Hayward, was suddenly and without warning arrested. A house on Cow Lane, close to Dunn's own home, was raided. Officials discovered Thomas, a priest and former monk, along with diverse Latin books, beads, images, palms, chalices, and such like. At the time, the penalty for being a Catholic priest was to be hanged, drawn, and quartered, which meant being stretched, hung until almost dead, and then having the arms and legs severed from the body while crowds looked on. It's unclear exactly what happened to Thomas, but tradition holds that he was executed as his family looked on. The punishments of Catholics were designed to be as performative as they were cruel. In response, the loyalty of families like Dunn's, necessarily driven underground, took on correspondingly strange and lurid shapes. The Thomas More Tooth, and the head it came from, is a vivid example. After More's death, his head was put on a pike for several weeks at London Bridge. His formidable daughter, Margaret Roper, bribed the executioner, whose job it was to take down the heads and throw them into the Thames, to give it to her instead. She pickled it in spices, and when one of the teeth worked loose, she gave it as a sacred relic to Jasper and Ellis Hayward, Dunn's uncles, both of whom were Jesuits, a then newish Catholic missionary order. There was a story that once, when the two uncles were going on separate journeys, unable to decide who got to take the tooth, it fell asunder and divided of itself. Not just Catholic, then but super-Catholic, the kind of Catholic which relishes the theatre and paraphernalia of martyrdom. Self-bifurcating molars and state-endorsed torture, these were the things of Dunn's early years. It was a darkly particular way to grow up, not only the terror and injustice, but the strangeness of it. How unhinged the world must feel that you are persecuted for professing that which you believe to be the most powerful possible truth. Not strange, as in unfamiliar, for being killed for your religion was hardly new. Strange, as in unmoored from all sense, reason, sanity. John Donne's mother almost certainly did not, in truth, carry Thomas More's head in her accoutrements. Margaret Roper had it until she died in 1544, when she left it to her husband, who was buried with it. It's unlikely that he would have loaned it out, like a library book. Dunn was not sent to school, but instead educated at home. His friend and biographer, Isaac Walton, tells us that he learnt fluent Latin, and in 1584 he enrolled with his younger brother Henry at Hart Hall, Oxford University. Their ages were given as eleven and ten, respectively, although, in fact, they were both a year older. Dunn was unlikely to have been lonely there. He had Henry, his familiar companion, to bicker with and protect. They had a well-off aunt, a Mrs. Dawson, whose husband, Robert, kept the Blue Boar Inn on the corner of what is now Blue Boar Street and St. Aldate's. The Dawsons would have welcomed the boys, Catholicism and all. And soon Dunn had friends. There was Richard Baker, grandson of the first ever Chancellor of the Exchequer, and there was Henry Wotton, Baker's roommate. It was to Wotton that Dunn wrote, Sir, more than kisses, letters mingle souls, for thus friends absent speak. After about three years at Oxford, Walton said Dunn took his magpie mind to Cambridge, although no record of Dunn being enrolled there for a degree exists, and when we next see Dunn, he is in London in 1591. 
he chose to follow in the footsteps of his magic-toothed ancestor Thomas More by enrolling at the Inns of Court, specifically Lincoln's Inn. But the twenty-year-old Dunn did not go to the Inns intending to become a lawyer. He went to be among rich, sharp-witted young men who also did not intend to become lawyers. Here Dunn seems to have joyfully erupted out of the solemn hardships of his youth and into the delight and noise of London. Though not rich, he had come into a moderate fortune from his father, enough to eat and drink and dress well. He was elected the inn's Master of the Revels, in charge of putting on pageantry and wild parties for his fellow scholars, with raucous singing and drinking and dancing of the galliard, the finest fashion at the time. The dance, which involved a series of enormous leaps and small hops, kicks and spins, was Elizabeth's favourite. She was said, even in her fifties, to dance six or seven galliards in a morning. The space in which Dunn lived would have been small. He shared his bedroom, and probably the bed itself, with a friend, Christopher Brook, but each had a tiny study of his own, little more than a cell with a set of shelves for books, a stool, and a table. During his time at the inns he began the writing of five long satirical poems, mocking, with a young man's fury, the corruptions of the church, the bar, the court, and they give a good sense of what his life looked like. Satire One imagines a fellow student bursting in on him. Away, thou changeling motley humorist, leave me, and in this standing wooden chest, consorted with these few books, let me lie in prison, and here be coffined when I die. It was from that room, tiny as a standing wooden chest, that some of Dunn's earliest poetry came. His earlier poems are often shot through with throwaway jokes, sallies against boredom, which allowed him to show to his newfound friends that, though he might have less money and fewer acres than them, yet he had a faster wit. The voice is more conventional than the later verse would be, but even in the early work there is that same presence, bold and ornery and intricate, that we find later. Dunn knew that he had the seeds of something original, that what he was doing with the English language was fresh and different. In a sonnet to Samuel Brooke, his roommate Christopher's little brother, he writes, I sing not siren-like to tempt, for I am harsh. His voice was starting to take shape. Dunn sounded like nobody else. The majority of his fellow poets were obedient to forms and rhyme schemes inherited from the classical greats and from European traditions of courtly verse. Think of Walter Raleigh writing to Queen Elizabeth. If love could find a quill drawn from an angel's wing, or did the muses sing that pretty wanton's will? Many of Dunn's readers who came after him have, for this reason, disliked his work, in the way you would dislike a tooth in a basket of flowers. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, for one. Dunn, whose muse on dromedary trots, wreathe iron pokers into true love knots. But for Dunn, divergence from the accent and peculiar breaks in form contained the very stamp of what he meant. They were never aimless. The world was harsh, and he needed a harsh language. Satire three is an attack on all authority, a furious bark of a poem that orders us to doubt wisely. Kind pity chokes my spleen, brave scorn forbids these tears to issue which swell my eyelids. I must not laugh nor weep sins and be wise. Can railing, then, cure these worn maladies? Dunn did not want to sound like other poets. Human experience exceeds our capacity to either explain or express it. Dunn knew it, and so he invented new words and new forms to try. He created new rhythms in poetry. He was an inventor of words, a neologismist. 
He accounts for the first recorded use in the Oxford English Dictionary of around 340 words in the English language. Apprehensible. Beauteousness. Bystander. Criminalist. Emancipation. in ripen, Fecundate. Horridness. Embrotheled. Jig. And for those who bristle against the loose use of disinterested to mean not interested rather than lacking a vested interest, Dunn was the first to do so, and we must take it up with him. He wanted to wear his wit like a knife in his shoe. He wanted it to flash out at unexpected moments. He is at his most scathing writing about originality and those who would steal the ideas of better men. But he is worst, who beggarly doth chore others' wits, fruits, and in his ravenous maw rawly digested doth those things outspew as his own things. Dunn imagined his own words taken by another. He imagined them chewed up and expelled. And they're his own, tis true. For if one eat my meat, though it be known the meat was mine, the excrements his own. Why should we all sound the same? There are parts of us which can be expressed well in neatly rhyming couplets. There are love-dove pockets in each human heart. But there are elements of each of us so particular, unwieldy, so without cliché, that it is necessary for each poet to invent his own language. It is necessary for us all to do so. Owning one's own language is not an optional extra. The human soul is so ruthlessly original, the only way to express the distinctive pitch of one's own heart is for each of us to build our own way of using our voice. To read done is to be told, kill the desire to keep the accent and tone of the time. It is necessary to shake language until it will express our own distinctive hesitations, peculiarities, our own uncertain and never quite successful yearning towards beauty. Dunn saves his most ruthless scorn for those who chew other wits, fruit, and shit out platitudes. Language, his poetry tells us, is a set not of rules, but of possibilities. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Dunn's pleasure in Lincoln's Inn, in teasing his fellow students, in testing the scope of his linguistic virtuosity, lasted roughly a year. It was shattered by a double bill of disaster, by persecution and by plague. In 1593, cases of plague began to grow exponentially. The theatres were closed, the bear baiting was forced to shut, the brothels emptied. In the streets, officials wielded three-foot-long martial wands to swat at people who weren't maintaining social distancing. William Shakespeare, who across the river was just beginning to make his name as a playwright, found his livelihood temporarily overturned, swiftly switched to poetry, and wrote Venus and Adonis, an epic which abruptly made him famous at court. Dunn wrote a lament for the city's swagger. Now pleasure's dearth our city doth possess, our theatres are filled with emptiness, as lank and thin as every street and way as a woman delivered yesterday. Dunn had been at Lincoln's Inn for a year when his brother Henry was arrested. Henry was John's junior by a year and had followed him after Oxford to Thavies Inn, close by Lincoln's Inn. In the spring of 1593, Henry took a young priest called William Harrington into his chambers. He planned to hide him from Elizabeth's priest hunters and feed him and care for him in secret. He was still barely more than a child, or he would have seen the impossibility of it. Henry's fellow scholars would have been all around eating and working and gossiping. How did he expect to get food to him? How did he expect to wash Harrington's clothes, to dispose of his waste, to keep friends away? In May, without warning, Henry's chambers were raided. 
A man called Richard Young hunted through his rooms and found Harrington inside. Both William and Henry were arrested, but Harrington, trained to withstand pain, at first steadfastly denied being involved in the Catholic Church. Henry betrayed him. He broke under questioning and admitted that Harrington had said he was a priest and did shrive him. To shrive is to listen to confession. Henry and Harrington were sent first to the Clink prison and then to Newgate. Newgate Jail, rebuilt in 1423, was notorious for its dirt and cruelty. By the time Henry was sent there, it was a grotesque place, cold and dark and humiliating. Corruption and bribery were accepted as the norm. Prisoners were kept in leg irons and forced to pay for their own board. The floor was said to crunch because of the carpet of lice, dead and alive. It was from Newgate that Harrington was tried and found guilty of high treason on the 18th of February, 1594. He was subjected to the death of a traitor. It was reported that he was drawn from Newgate to Tyburn and there hanged, cut down alive, struggled with the hangman, but was bowled and quartered. Henry never saw his friend leave Newgate for the scaffold. The plague was running untrammeled through the cells. Dunn did not visit his brother in jail. He delayed a few days. Perhaps he was afraid of the plague, or perhaps there was nobody who could tell him there was an urgency. He may not have known what was happening to the boy with whom he had gone, small and alone, to face the older, taller undergraduates of Oxford. Within days of arriving in Newgate, Henry was feverish, tortured by buboes. He died fast. He was nineteen years old. Dunn barely wrote about his brother's death in the letters that we have, but fever and corruption and plague got into his writing. Often ill in later life, Dunn was handsome, but not strong. Henry's death must have made it more terrifying. To have lost his brother to plague would have made every one of Dunn's own itches or coughs a terror. Later in life, Dunn repeatedly fell ill with what's now thought to have been relapsing fever, a tick-borne infection. The symptoms were exactly those of the early stages of plague. Each time he felt it rise in him, there would have been the question, was it the old familiar fever, or had Henry's contagion come for him? There's a kind of imaginative ferocity to Dunn's writing about death after Henry, and it grows over time as he loses more and more of the people he loves, and their ghosts pile up around him. He becomes a peddler of the grotesque, a forensic scholar of the entropy of the body. The word decay appears a dozen times in his verse, and that old Norse word, rot, is scattered through his work. Of an imagined love rival, he writes, In early and long scarceness may he rot. In an elegy, he demands of us, Think that thy body rots. He wrote of death. Now wantonly he spoils and eats us not, but breaks off friends and lets us piecemeal rot. Between Thomas More's execution in 1535 and Henry's death in 1593, we can count eleven members of Dunn's family who died in exile or in prison for their Catholicism. There was some majesty and glory, as with Thomas More, who ended by being canonized by the Catholic Church, but also plenty of humiliation and muddy uncertainties. Exactly when Dunn turned from Catholicism to Protestantism is the central boxing ring of Dunn's studies. How, when, and why the young man decided to turn away from the rituals and well-loved rites of his childhood. In 1593, at Henry's death, Dunn was still Catholic, and when he married, he was not. What happened in between? Is it possible that he licked a finger and held it to the political wind and saw that no man could advance while remaining a Catholic? It's possible there was never a change of heart, only of expedience, but if the conversion was real, there was probably no single burst of light or dark that caused it. Like almost everything in our rusty, hinged, slow-moving world, it happened in pieces, 
There was the power of his ambition, and his understanding that promotion and success would not be compatible with open Catholicism. But there would also have been new books and new conversations, drinking with Protestants, flirtations with Protestants. There would have been the pull of other allegiances over denominational ones, to the monarch and to the idea of nationhood, which slowly took on the shape of national loyalism and led him towards the Church of England. His priorities shifted, realigned, took on new shapes. You too have experienced time. And what happened to Henry must have been part of it. Dunn wrote nothing that explicitly names his brother, in part because he wrote very little about any of his family. There are far more of his words to be found about eagles, dust, the suburb of Mitcham and Tax, than his own mother. But he did write... Grief which did drown me, and half quenched by it, are satric fires which urged me to have writ in scorn of all. In that lack of naming, you could hear the guilt that must have haunted him. He would have known that Henry was sheltering Harrington. It's been suggested Dunn may even have helped shelter the man himself, although there's no evidence for it except the bond of closeness between the two brothers. The loss shaped him. It seemed to clarify his sense of the necessity of seizing control of your own self and own fate. He told a friend in a verse letter in the 1590s, Be thine own home, and in thyself dwell. Henry was dead, and the delight of London was dead too. By 1596, Dan was keen to get away. He was finished with the law and with the life he had led. Untrained and inexperienced though he was, Dunn joined a naval expedition against Spain. In early June they set out, dressed in their finest clothes, silver and lace gleaming, cheered by crowds. Their weapons shone, and they were some of the best equipped men to have departed England's docks for many years. The first portion of the expedition was an admiral's dream. After just over two weeks, the English sailed in sight of Cadiz, where they launched a cannon attack on the Spanish ships in harbour. It was a great success, but the kind of success that was terrible to watch. Dunn wrote in his epigram, Nave Arsa, a burnt ship. Out of a fired ship which by no way but drowning could be rescued from the flame, some men leaped forth, and ever as they came near the foe's ships, did by their shot decay. So all were lost, which in the ship were found, they in the sea being burnt, they in the burnt ship drowned. In 1597 he took part in a second unsuccessful expedition with Walter Raleigh, which immediately ran into a violent storm. Dunn wrote that it rained more than if the sun had drunk the sea before, and some coffined in their cabins lie, equally grieved that they are not dead and yet must die. In chaos they made it back to shore. Slowly the ships were repaired, the sailors loitered about in the port waiting to begin again, though some thought better of it, found horses and galloped home. Dunn was tougher than the boys who went riding home for warm fires and clean clothes, but he was undelighted by the way the days were going. In late August the fleet prepared to set out again for Spain, but the crew was depleted, dirty and sick. The rest of the expedition was chaotic. The ships communicated largely by musket fire, and it's difficult to be specific with a musket. The Spanish fleet evaded the English. The English could find no viable way to attack it. They seized a few straggling ships, but failed to take several larger ones. They returned home, rocking and tipping through huge waves, to a royal reception as stormy as the weather. Nobody gathered at the dock to cheer. Sailors had foot-rot and suppurating wounds. Dunn did not attempt the privateering life again. Perhaps, though, voyaging had got into his blood, or perhaps it was always there. His poetry after his sally on the sea is shot through with images of exploration, discovery, fresh territory. Oh, my America, my new-found land! 
Newfound lands were at the forefront of the Renaissance mind, that and maps of lands. The first accurate map of England and Wales, Christopher Saxton's Atlas of 1579, became a kind of talisman. Dunn would have seen it. Years later, near the end of his life, he would imagine himself a paper-thin chart. Whilst my physicians by their love are grown cosmographers, and I their map who lie flat on this bed. And just as west and east, when the map is folded, meet and touch, and become the same, so west, death, becomes the east, rebirth. As west and east in all flat maps, and I am one, are one, so death doth touch the resurrection. Before that, though, before he knew about pain and fever, there was the thrill of exploration. Dunn's verse insists over and over that we approach another body with the same awe with which we would step onto unknown earth. In The Good Morrow, from around 1602, he wrote it out, step-by-step -step instructions. Let sea discoverers to new worlds have gone, let maps to others worlds on worlds have shown, let us possess one world, each hath one, and is one. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Who was she? And more. The very young woman with whom the complicated, furious, funny poet was so in love. We know very little. We do not even know how she preferred to spell her own name. As with the capriciousness typical of the period, she is spelled Anne both with and without an E. It was her second name, though, that Dunn played on over and over. As much more loving, as more sad. He first met her the third daughter of Sir George Moore, when she was only about 14 years old, and he was working as a secretary in Thomas Edgerton's household. She had been sent to London to learn the ways of the city and the court, and something in her face or manner bludgeoned John Dunn in the heart. Given her father's wealth, she was likely to have been fashionable, and her clothes would have been good. Stitching elaborate needle lace was the rage, and necklines were having a moment of extremes, either rising high to the chin or scooped so low they skated close to the nipple. But his poetry never describes her clothes or her body. Dunn's metaphors are vivid, wild, evocative and potent, but they are strikingly unspecific. It never occurred to him to tell us if she curved at the hip, or jutted at the collarbone, or was taller than him. Presumably it was not what was important. The hunger and the body itself were what mattered. Perhaps to look for Anne in Dunn's verse is to misunderstand what the poems are doing. They're not representations of her, but representations of him. Him watching her, needing her, inventing for her. They are trumpet blasts across a hard land, more than they are portraits. In a valediction of my name in a window, written in 1599, Dunn imagines etching his name with a diamond ring on a window, and his lover seeing her own reflection and his name intermingled. "'Tis much that glass should be as all-confessing and through shine as I, "'Tis more that it shows thee to thee and clear reflects thee to thine eye. "'But all such rules love's magic can undo. "'Here you see me, and I am you.'" Her willingness to defy her father was a remarkable thing. She must have had in her a flash of daring in a world that insisted on obedience. She could only have met done in secret, and secret places were not easy to find. They might have been able to collide under the plausible deniability of public spaces, parks, popular walks, church. They might have attended events in the evening. Pageants, which could be so crowded that silk-clad bodies would press against each other. She took vast risks for him, larger than he took for her. Spurred on by desire, or perhaps by Dunn's urgent importuning, or by the wild optimism of youth, she risked gossip, scandal and, perhaps at the very end, pregnancy. 
They may well have been lovers in the weeks before they wed, hiding behind insouciant faces and very careful timing. She gave a great, recklessly romantic leap into the dark. The landing was not to be a soft one. Was he worth the sacrifice when she foreswore the thousand easier futures that surrounded her? The alternatives would have been right in front of her. She could have aimed for a life more like that of her cousin by marriage, Elizabeth, who had that year been married off to Baron Hastings with all the castles and gardens and wall hangings embroidered with unicorns that that involved. What was done that she decided to risk her father's wrath in order to share his days, his small income, his bed? If he took her to bed like he wrote, if he knew how to render bodily his poetry, then he was worth sacrificing all the wall hangings in England for. To read him, to read all of his love poems together, is to feel yourself change, for his is a passion which acknowledges the strangeness you are born with. His best poetry is a triumphant call of desire, sincerity, joke, all bound into one. It's there, for instance, in A Valediction Forbidding Morning. The lovers are imagined as the two feet of a pair of mathematical compasses joined eternally at the base. If they be two, they are two so. As stiff twin compasses are two, thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth, if the other do. And though it in the centre sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it, and grows erect as it comes home. It is so extravagantly witty, and so riotously plays only by its own rules. It needed to be clever, because he demands that sex be intelligent. It's the poem of a man who has the temerity and invention to see the human condition in a piece of metal. It loves the body, because Dunn, unlike so many of the highbrow poets who went before him, never pretended not to have a body. Grows erect as it comes home is a pun so obvious it might as well be a little sketch of a penis. But it is fundamental to his love poetry that the body Dunn imagines isn't just a body. It transforms and becomes simultaneously other things a world, a state, a city, a planetary sweep. The lover looks at the woman in The Good Morrow and sees a world atlas. Where can we find two fitter hemispheres without sharp north, without declining west? In To His Mistress Going to Bed, the woman's girdle becomes a constellation of stars, and her body is the entire world. Off with that girdle like heaven's zone glistering, but a far fairer world encompassing. And again, my kingdom safeliest when with one man manned. And the man in the sun rising chides the rising sun, declares, she all states and all princes I. She becomes the world. Since thy duties be to warm the world, that's done in warming us. Shine here to us, and thou art everywhere. This bed thy centre is, these walls thy sphere. Some of that woman as state, woman as world, is done working in a tradition, but some of it was personal. Dunn's relentless imagination was his single most constant feature. His mind had ceaselessness built into it. It was to be, throughout his life, a sight of new images, new theology, new doubts. Even those who disliked his work acknowledged that he was a writer who had erupted through the old into the new. But the always of that imagination must have been exhausting. For a mind like that, sex, real sex, true sex, would allow a singleness to hush the multitudinous mind. It's why so much of Dunn's imagery around sex is so totalizing. The man and woman become one. The woman becomes a state, a country, a planet. Sex for Dunn and those like him. Permission for those who watch the world with such feverish care to turn one person into the world and to watch only them. It was a transforming 
of his constant seeking for knowledge. To adore and to devour and to be devoured is its own kind of focus, a gasp of a different kind of oxygen. And so they married. The wedding took place about three weeks before Christmas, in 1601, according to Dunn. It was very small, no more than five guests. After the wedding, Anne returned to her family home, Loseley Park, in the countryside, with her oblivious father, as if nothing had happened, and Dunn went back to his lodgings to wait and hope. To hope for what, beyond a good moment to break the news, is hard to say. The moment didn't come. So in the end, on the 2nd of February, almost two months after the wedding day, he wrote a letter and sent it to his father-in-law via the ninth Earl of Northumberland, Henry Percy. It wasn't by any reckoning a good letter. Dunn was aiming for both humility and authority. He instead succeeded in sounding at once overconfident and mildly unhinged. I knew my present estate less than fit for her. I knew, yet I knew not why, that I stood not right in your opinion. I knew that to have given any intimation of it had been to impossibilitate the whole matter. I know this letter shall find you full of passion, but I know no passion can alter your reason and wisdom, to which I adventure to commend these particulars, that it is irremediably done. He spells it D-O-N-N-E, a fantastically inappropriate pun on his own name. That if you incense my lord, you destroy her and me. That it is easy to give us happiness, and that my endeavours and industry, if it please you to prosper them, may soon make me somewhat worthier of her. It's multiple requests rolled up in one. Daughter, and a job, and forgiveness. From the point of view of George Moore, with his notoriously quick temper and his aspirations to nobility, it was a disaster. Anne might have formed a great alliance, have given him titled in-laws with whom to socially machinate. Now she had bound herself to a scribbling reprobate without property and with a dead religious traitor for brother. Sir George went immediately to Dunn's employer, Thomas Edgerton. Anne was still a minor, so Dunn had broken canon law. The case went to the city's commissioners. Dunn was summarily dismissed from Edgerton's household, and to his bewilderment thrown into the Fleet Prison to await further investigation. The Fleet Prison was simultaneously disgusting and expensive. A debtor's prison, it didn't have the dignity and royal tinge of the tower. It stood on the banks of the River Fleet in East London and had a grill looking onto the street through which prisoners could beg for arms. Prisons were profit-making enterprises. You paid for each turn of the key, paid to have your irons removed, paid for your food and lodging. Dunn's brother had died in one prison. Now he was in another, and like Henry he was growing increasingly desperately unwell. On the 11th of February, locked in his cell, he wrote a more desperate plea to Sir George. He no longer stood upon his pride. And though perchance you intend not utter destruction, yet the way through which I fall towards it is so headlong that being thus pushed I shall soon be at bottom. I have no refuge but that of mercy which I beg of him, my lord, and you. This new humbler letter asked more to think of Anne. Dunn's fall from nuptial rebellion to obeisance was very swift, fast enough to overturn his whole understanding of what you could and couldn't talk your way around. Sir George sent word in return that he would leave the matter up to Edgerton, who ordered that Dunn should be allowed to return to his lodgings. He stayed there, under house arrest in dark midwinter, while the legality of his marriage to Anne was decided. Dunn's health began to improve, but his life was still in chaos. While the High Commission deliberated, he continued to send out flocks of letters. Some were to Sir George. In one he reiterated his passion for Anne and begged permission to send a note to her. Very slowly, George Moore began to come round. 
On the 27th of April, 1602, the Court of Audience declared Dunn's marriage good and sufficient. It was a very unambiguous victory. A true and pure marriage, it was declared, had been contracted between the said Anne Moore, alias Dunn, and John Dunn. Dunn was at last allowed to take up his wife. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Dunn's marriage to Anne without the blessing of her father ended all possible preferment at court. Losing his employment with Sir Thomas Edgerton, they began married life in a small cottage near Woking in Surrey, provided by a young cousin of Anne's. Money was tight. Dunn had no obvious employment, and though children quickly followed, several died in infancy. In 1612, he was befriended by Sir Robert Drury after writing a funeral elegy for his daughter and was installed in a house in Drury Lane. Dunn was now in the very heart of London, no longer having to make the long journey on horseback to and from his family, and it was alive with bite and noise and possibility. More children came. Little Nicholas arrived in 1613. Money grew tighter. Dunn had to give up his horse and beg or borrow one whenever he needed a mount. His friend and biographer Walton paints Dunn in these days as caught between two desires. He had been living for so long in expectation of a state employment that the hope was ingrained, but in him other different desires were growing strong. A pull at him to work for God's glory in holy orders. Dunn was urgently aware, always, of the fleeing time. From 1607 to 1615, he hesitated. His hairline began to recede, and he knew himself to be stepping into middle age. A decision had to be made. Slowly, in both doubt and hope, Dunn's eyes turned towards the church. One reading of Dunn's turn to the priesthood is that it was an expediency, a second best. Many people looking over his life have believed that his heart and ambition lay always with the court. The church was a compromise, a road to public respectability and reliable money, and a way to finally scrub out the stain of what Walton called the remarkable error of his marriage. And there must have been some truth in that. He had always known himself to be rare, and he wanted his talents to be recognised. But the idea that Dunn chose the church only because his ambition had failed elsewhere elides one fact. Dunn had to fight to get there. There was a tenacity in his desire to reach the church, though it was not straightforward. It had grit in it. What changed and pushed Dunn to navigate the last steps to the pulpit? In part, the deaths of two of his children. Mary, aged three, in May 1614, and Francis, aged seven, in November, acted as a knife and a spur all at once. They galvanised him into both misery and more urgent action. On the 3rd of December, we find Dunn on his way to Newmarket to discuss his purpose with the king in person. There he met with as good allowance and encouragement as he could have longed for. He promptly began to prepare for priesthood. In the bleak middle of winter, 23rd of January, 1615, Dunn went quietly to St. Paul's Cathedral to be ordained. He was 42. Very swiftly, he was appointed to be a chaplain in ordinary to the king. James was, in comparison to Queen Elizabeth, an addict of the pulpit, and had doubled the number of sermons the monarch heard preached every week. Renaissance sermons were long often upwards of an hour, some up to three, but they were heard hungrily. They had breaking news in them, politics, entertainment, theatre. People gossiped about them and picked over them in the week that followed. Dunn preached without a text in front of him. He would write the sermon out in full, take notes, and memorise it. For the first time, Dunn unleashed his charisma upon live, reactive audiences who could eat in full and demand more. His fame spread fast. 
In the summer of 1616, he was made priest in charge of Sevenoaks in Kent, a sinecure worth perhaps eighty pounds. Within a year of his ordination, he was offered fourteen different clerical positions. At last, his prosperity was growing fast enough to meet the needs of his family. But as his fortunes rose, tragedy rose alongside. Anne died, and it was a baby that killed her. On the 10th of August, 1617, she gave birth to a stillborn child. The labour, her twelfth, was too long and too hard. She survived less than a week before mother and child were buried in the same grave. They lie in the graveyard of St. Clement Danes amid the rush of buses going down the Strand towards the West End's theatres. Seven of her children lived to mourn her, aged from fourteen-year-old Constance to little Elizabeth, just reaching her first birthday. It was for Dunn an irreversible end. He would not take another lover. She was his last. He wrote in a poem, My good is dead. If pain takes the precise shape of the love you have for the dead, then his heart in those days must have been complicated and terrible. Finally, in 1621, the king sent for the 49-year-old Dunn and asked him to arrive at dinner time the next day. According to Walton, when his majesty sat down, before he had eat any meat, he said after his pleasant manner, Dr. Dunn, I have invited you to dinner, and though you sit not down with me, yet I will carve to you of a dish that I know you love well, for knowing you love London, I do therefore make you Dean of St. Paul's. The deanship was a heavy responsibility carrying with it the imperative to stir the hearts and mind the souls of the whole of London. But it was also a fantastic piñata of a job. Hit it, and perks and favours and new connections came pouring out. The installation took place on the 22nd of November, 1621. Dunn was ushered into St. Paul's like a bride, presented to the bishop, and processed up into the cathedral and to the altar. A te deum was sung under the high, echoing ceiling. Dunn prostrated himself upon the stone ground. He kissed the altar and rose to stand in the church that was now his own. Technically, Dunn was bound to preach only three times a year, Christmas, Easter, and Ascension Day. But he was a man who preached like others eat meat, hungrily. To read the full text of a Dunn sermon is a little like mounting a horse, only to discover that it is an elephant, large and unfamiliar. To modern ears, they are winding, elongated, perambulating things, a pleasure that is also work. If you are a scholar, they offer notes to an A to Z of Renaissance religious flashpoints. Aquinas, bishops, casuistry, divine right of kings, Erastianism, Gnostics, heresy, incarnation. But they can also be mined by those reading for other, less erudite, and more unpindownable reasons. You could turn to Dunn's sermons for meditations on the gospel as the bedrock of faith. It's John, the man who trafficked in powerful metaphors, Christ as true light, Christ as the word, whom Dunn loves best. That, and wholly unsurprisingly, the Psalms. The whole frame of the poem, he wrote of one, is akin to a beating out of a piece of gold. You can also find him in the sermons at his most authoritarian. There are places where he is harsh, where his audience would have expected joy. At the wedding of Lucy Goodyear to the supremely handsome diplomat Francis Nethersole, he declared, Marriage is but a continual fornication sealed with an oath. Sex, he bemoaned, had overtaken all else in marriage. We rise poorer, ignobler, weaker for every night's sin than we lay down. We sin and sin and sin. It's a long way from the gleeful rakery of his youth. Anne was dead, he was older and in physical pain, and his thinking about sex had taken on a flinty quality. 
What Lucy and Francis thought of being sent in such funereal tones to their marriage bed is not, alas, recorded. But Dunn is at his most remarkable when he speaks about how very hard it is to seek God at all. More than anyone else, he acknowledged the way that the human heart darts about like a rat. His body, he found so readily present in desire for other humans, betrayed him when he sought the same intensity in prayer. I throw myself down in my chamber, and I call in and invite God and his angels thither. And when they are there, I ignore God and his angels for the noise of a fly, for the rattling of a coach, for the whining of a door. I talk on. Sometimes I find that I forgot what I was about, but when I began to forget it, I cannot tell. A memory of yesterday's pleasures, a fear of tomorrow's dangers, a straw under my knee, a noise in mine ear, a light in mine eye, and anything, and nothing, a fancy, a chimera in my brain, troubles me in my prayer. It is his lifelong quest and lifelong disappointment that we cannot be struck daily by lightning. This is the same Dun who, in the Holy Sonnets, seeks a force so great that it will sweep away doubt, exhaustion, distraction, and leave something stripped back and certain. Batter my heart, three-personed God, for you, as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, o'erthrow me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. It's not possible, of course. It doesn't happen for him. He remains relentlessly embodied and therefore relentlessly distractible. And for all his bitterness and furies, he was insistent on joy. When David danced and leaped and shouted before the ark, if he laughed, too, it misbecame him not. Not to show that joy is an argument against thankfulness of the heart. That is a stupidity. This is a contempt. The idea resonated through his life. He had written years before to Henry Goodyear, Our nature is meteoric. We respect, because we partake so, both earth and heaven. For as our bodies glorified shall be capable of spiritual joy, so our souls, demerged into those bodies, are allowed to partake earthly pleasure. We do wrong if we deliberately bury ourselves in dull monastic sadness. Later he wrote, Heaven is expressed by singing, Hell by weeping. He knew, as Dante did, that there is a special place in hell for those who, when they could laugh, chose instead to sigh. It's in his sermons, as it was in all his work. Dunn was able to hold two conflicting truths ever in front of him, a kind of duck-rabbit of the human condition. Humanity, as he saw it, was rotten with corruption and weakness and failure, and even so it was the great light of the universe. He gloried in mankind. If the inner world of each human was extended outwards, he wrote, man would be the giant and the world the dwarf. Few people would turn to Dunn's poetry or prose with its twisting logic and deliberate difficulty for solace, but you might turn to him to be reminded that, for all its horror, the human animal is worth your attention, your awe, your love.